okay? The, the ministry was flourishing, you know, everything was going good, the word was spreading, miracles, followers, everything, and then what happens? Crucifixion, right? So crucifixion, good day or bad day, like 2,000 years ago? Bad day, bad day right? Like everything they had been following, uh, following basically just kind of went away. Right? And then you have Friday and Saturday, and then like the disciples are in turmoil, they're probably in hiding, you had St. Peter who fled, you know, um, all this crazy stuff. And then on Sunday, what happens? Resurrection. And he appears. And the disciples were like, we knew it, right? Like, like it wasn't all for nothing. So, and it's great because um, when he came back, St. Peter talks, uh, uh, no, not St. Peter, uh, but in Acts 10, 40 through 41, you know, he addresses this and he says, him, God who raised on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to the witnesses chosen before God, and even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. So what this is talking about, it's that, it's that period of time, right? Where Christ, he, he resurrected, and he spent the 40 days with them. And these 40 days must have been glorious days, right? And they were right back there, and they were interacting with him, and they were feeling him. And now, you know, even more of his divinity is shining through, and the fact he's walking through walls, and he's speaking more clearly, and he's revealing more things to them. And then, out of nowhere, guess what happens? He's gone again. So now he ascends. Now this time, the ascension's a little bit nicer than the, than the uh, crucifixion, because at least they see what's going on. Right? And he gives him a message, and he tells him what's happening. And he says, it's better for me to leave. Right? Like, it's better for me to leave, because I'm going to leave you a helper. Um, and he ascends back into heaven. So you can imagine what the church was going through at that time, but I'm also going to ask you guys, imagine what heaven was going through at that time. Right? Imagine what it was like when Christ got back to heaven. And honestly, I can't even wrap my mind around the celebration that must have happened at that time. You know, after... You know, after spending that time on earth, you know, and then he's on his way back up. He's surrounded by angels, the heavenly hosts. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's back with the cherubim and the cherubim, and they're just chanting, holy, holy, holy. And you have the censors and the priests, and you have all of this stuff all rejoicing that, like, Christ is back. And I truly believe that if we understood more about heaven, it would blow our minds. I think for us, our heaven is what we consider that is our like that's our prize at the end of a life well lived but I will tell you I think heaven is so much more than that and I think that if we understood it we would desire it more we would pursue it more uh, the women's group who meet on Tuesday nights but I think you guys are on a break right now but that's just a shameless plug but um, on the women's night uh, when, <laughs> women's meeting on, on Tuesday nights uh, they just finished up the study on the tabernacle and I was talking to Christina and she was sharing all of this stuff and she was like this tabernacle is just foreshadowing for heaven and she was breaking down even just all the, the items in the tabernacle and how this is just a preview of things to come in heaven um, and I think that we're probably not ex as excited as we should be about heaven. I think um, I am not as excited as I should be at heaven. Because when you look at the things that we are pursuing on our life here, right? If you look at the, the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years of your life, whatever it might be, right? What have you been chasing after? Kids. I'm chasing after kids. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we chase after career, right? We chase after financial stability right we chase after relationships when we all do that yep. right we chase after you know you have people who race who chase after financial stability and then you have people who chase after riches right popularity fame or whatever it might be um, and I think that it's easy for us to chase after those things because it's easier to pursue them and a lot of the times when we are pursuing these things inadvertently on mistake or maybe even on purpose they might turn into some false idols in our life because at least we know what we're pursuing right at least I know when I catch it I know when I get it but on the other side I believe that if we understood heaven a little bit more we would understand a little bit more how to pursue it and we would want it more because you cannot pursue something that you have no idea what it is Right? That's kind of like sales 101. You can't hit the goal if you don't even know what the goal is. Um, so in this meeting, and what we're going to be doing in the next, I haven't decided exactly how many weeks yet because honestly I haven't finished the book. But have you guys heard of this book? I guess it's kind of a, it's a popular book right now, um, Orthodox Afterlife. 
Is that anybody even sound familiar? Yes. Okay, so popular book came out, I don't know how long ago, but everyone started talking about it. It was brought to my attention. I thought it'd be a cool book to kind of go through, but I'll give you the premise of it. Um, so this is, this is a, a book, it's written by John Habib, which I say John Habib and every single one of you probably, could probably say, oh yeah, I know that guy. But no, John Habib is probably the most generic Coptic name that you've ever come across. I guarantee you every single one of us knows a John Habib. But, um, but it's cool because he tells like, you know, in, uh, in the beginning part of the book, uh, in the introduction, he talks about like a little bit of his story. Right? And I think this is a story that right, might resonate with a lot of us, that he was kind of growing up, kind of doing his own thing, you know, Coptic Orthodox, but not necessarily devout, not necessarily practicing, this and that. But he had the power of a praying mom. Okay? And his mom gave him this story. Um, it was a handwritten account of something that happened to this monk in Egypt whose name was Abuna, um, Abuna Butros. And when she gave it to him, he kind of read, he read through it and it was about his like near-death experience, okay? And then when, when he read it, he was just like, okay, this is either the fakest thing I've ever read or this is a complete and utter game changer, right? And if this is a game changer, if this actually happened and if this is true, then this should change the way that we all live our lives and the way that we look at heaven, the way that we look at earth, the way that we look at our struggle and, and everything else. So at this point, because he was kind of a little bit, you know, not practicing, um, he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this from like a very analytical point of view and I'm actually going to go through and say, if this is what he experienced as like an Orthodox Christian, I'm going to go research other Orthodox Christian accounts of like a near-death experience or an afterlife experience and I'm going to compare them. And if they don't match, then this is all for nothing. I can't, I can't believe this monk and I can't believe any of these other, uh, these other people. But if I take all of these stories independently from, um, from one another who don't, written by different people who don't know on each other but they all kind of experience the same thing well then guess what? Then chances are this is true. Um, and, and this book goes through a lot of these comparisons and, and I think that you know by going through this book it's going to let us know a little bit more about what's on the other side of this. Because we're all running this race. Whether you're doing it intentionally or unintentionally, we are all running this race. But if we know what's on the other side, maybe we'll be able to run a little bit better. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time with the backbone of what the story is, which is talking about Father Boutros' life, right? Um, not his life, but his, his near-death experience. Because that's where it all started. And full disclosure, reading the book, there's a lot of people, honestly, we have to say it, um, we are skeptical people. Right? So when Father Boutros' writings all, all kind of came out, you know, he had a full array of commentators. Um, some people embraced it and said, no, this, this sounds kind of on point. It, it's in line with everything that the church teaches. I think that we're good. Um, some people openly rejected it and basically said, no, we think that this monk has no idea what he's talking about. He probably had a dream. Maybe he had bad food at night before he went to sleep. But whatever it was, we were not, we were not embracing this at all. And other people were skeptical. Right? And I will tell you, that's not what I'm going to be covering in this meeting. Right? For us, it's very, very simple. My goal is not to judge this. I'll take it a step further. Your goal is not to judge this. Um, but it's to kind of look at all of this and, and just look at the starting point. Because this is the starting point for John Habib's journey. And then it's going to be the springboard for everything else that we're going to be covering in like the coming weeks. Um, and then at the end of the coming weeks, and I encourage you guys, actually Orthodox Afterlife, it's on Amazon. That's where I bought my copy. So I will tell you that this book is way too thick for me to go through everything with you guys. But I would encourage you guys, if even the topic seems entertaining, um, from what I've read so far, it's a great book. I encourage you guys to kind of pick it up. Um, but my goal is at the end of the series, we can go back and then we can come up with our own conclusions. So I ask that we just walk into this open-minded. Um, and actually, a nice part that I'm not going to cover that I think it's, it's nice enough to pick up the book just for that was just his early life before he entered the monastery. I'm not covering any of that, but it's such a beautiful story about a man who just truly loved God and was willing to give everything to enter into the monastery. I would say that if nothing else, that it's worth picking up the book. So, Abuna Butchus' afterlife story. So imagine this. He's a monk living in, a, you know, living in, his, in his monastery. And then on one day, actually, so let me disclose this. Today is basically going to be story time. Okay? 
Don't expect deep revelations. Don't expect anything else, right? It's just basically going to be story time. I like this story. I hope that you will like the story as well. So, Abunad Bujas is, um, he's in a cell and there's a knock on his door. Okay? So he gets up and he answers the door and it's the angel of death. And the angel of death is basically saying, it's time. Right? Like, this is the beginning of the story. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is actually his letter. Right? This is his letter that he, he wrote. Yeah. So, um, so he asks the angel of, of uh, the angel of death. I say, hey, can I take a pen and paper with me? Like, I just want I want to write what I see, right? I want to write a letter. And the angel of death basically told him, I'm totally good with that, but on on the condition of two things, right? Number one, you don't write any secret words that man is not lawful for them to utter, right? And then number two, you don't disclose any of the mysteries. Right? He's like, if you can do those two things, then yes, you can come. And Abuna Butros, he is expressing his feelings of the fact that he was just terrified. Right? Like, that is a day that I think that all of us, when we get there, we will be terrified. And I will tell you, if you do not think that you should be terrified, this is a man who left everything to go to a monastery and gave up basically everything, and he's terrified. Okay? So if you are thinking you would not be terrified, you have bad self awareness. Okay, you should be terrified. Okay, every single one of us, um, <clears throat> because you think about it, this guy's whole life, right? Like, if you guys know the prayer of becoming a monk, right? Like when you go to the monastery, they have all the, the brothers at the time, and you lay them down, and they put this big curtain over them, and that's their death. So this is a monk who's already died, right? He's already carrying his cross. He's already been striving. Um, and he makes the comment that he's terrified, but at the same time, it comes with joy because he knows that he's prepared himself for this, right? Like he's, he's excited because he's heard so much about heaven and what's on the other side. And like the way that he even writes that is his humility that he shows just even in that is a way that just kind of floors me. And I'll ask you guys, what do you think that you would be filled with like when that knock comes? Uh, personally speaking, yeah, I know that I would be terrified. I don't even know if I'd have the joy in me. Because I didn't, like, I, I don't, like, he was a man who gave up a lot, right? He was a man who gave up a lot. When you read his backstory and everything that he gave up, he gave up a lot. So I can, I can imagine that if there's a guy who can stand before Christ and be like, look, I know that it's all by the blood, but, you know, I did do a little, right? That's him. But for us, like, I, I, I don't know. Um, so he wrote these mixed emotions, right? The joy of his departure and the dread of settling his accounts and his debts, right? And there's this beautiful part where he says, I looked around my cell, right? And I looked out the window. And, I came to the, and he came to the conclusion that he found nothing worth taking. Just think about what that means. You know, like, he knows. Like, that's it. Like, I'm done, right? What do you think he saw in his cell and out the window? Maybe not so much out the window, but what do you think he saw in his cell? It's crazy to think this, but his favorite stuff. Right? That's all, that's all that you would take into your cell. Right? You don't, you're a monk. You don't have a lot. But the stuff that's really, really meaningful to you, that stuff makes it in the cell. And he said, there's nothing, there's nothing here that like, I am personally attached to that I feel like I need to take with me. And it, it's a reminder of Ecclesiastes 1.14. It says, I have seen the works, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the winds. And again, in 2.11, it says, Then I looked on all the works that my hands have done, and on the labor which I have toiled, and indeed, all was vanity and grasping at the wind, and there was no profit under the sun. And I will tell you, I think that we all need to hear that. We all need to hear that, right? Because we chase things. We chase a lot of things, right? What are you pursuing right now that in the end days, right, when that knock comes, that knock's not going like, to, it, none of it's going to matter. Because I think we do a really, really good job. So I ask that you identify that in your life, right? Like, what are you chasing right now that's probably not worth all of the effort you're putting into it? Because when it's all said and done, it's not, it's not going to matter, right? So he says, so I didn't take anything, right? I left it all, nothing in my cell, nothing I saw outside, nothing was worth me taking. He says, and the only thing that I was able to take 
It was an old robe. And it was an old robe that no eye can see. And it was only seen in the spirit. Right? So now we know, okay, we got some symbolism going on right now. And he says that, it, and this old robe had been with me since my birth. Once it had been white, but now it became dirty with many, many stains, ranging from the large to the small. And he says, and the only reason I even wore this was to cover my own nakedness. And he said, and he headed to the door thinking, um, thinking that that was his way, right? Like, like that's it, he's ready to go. I'm going to leave from the door. But the angel basically looked at him. He was just like, yeah, we don't use those here, right? Like, <laughs> you're thinking material. We are in the immaterial, right? Um, he's, and the angel tells him that we are between the spirit and the body. And he explained to him that even this passing, it's not a physical passing. It's going from the visible to the invisible, from the limited to the limitless. And he says in like a moment, he felt literally that he had this outside of his body experience and everything was so big. Everything was so big. He said, when I looked at the entire universe, the entire universe, it seemed as in a drop in the ocean because of the fact that he wasn't bound by his, by his physical body. And he says, at the same time, all of this has happened with me and I'm departing from the world, right? Um, there was another spirit that departed at the same time that he did. And, and Father Boutros calls it his companion um, in death during the crossover. And on the way when he's kind of crossing over, he said, he saw... Five people, like all of them, like kind of the monastery, on his way out, right? And he called them his five friends. And the five friends were dealing with his passage very, very differently. His first friend was short-sighted. He says that he was only worried about the separation he would have now with Abuna Butros. He said, like, and this is, this is a very short-sighted Christian, right? This is the one who, they're not thinking about what's on the other side. They're just thinking about, how, how is this going to affect me? Right? And this is a sad thing. Right? And this actually ties into a portion of his life when his father passed away. And he refused for anyone to like, mourn. He was just like, this is a great thing. Right? He's like, we should be rejoicing. Like, my father is the part. He's, like, he's in paradise. Like, why, how could we be upset about that? We can, we can miss him. But we will not like, wail like, over it. The second was one that I was also crying, but he had a bright halo. And he was beating his chest, offering repentance and doing matanias. And, and he said that, that this brother, this one was moved by the, by the departure of Abuna Butras. But it wasn't just a regular he was moved, he was moved to repentance. And he says, and this is important, because when it is not enough to be moved for things, but when things happen to us, we need to examine ourselves, and this is what this brother did. He was able to examine himself, realize what his own shortcomings were and offer that as a sweet repentance to God so that this would actually be a positive effect in his life. The third was, a, uh, was someone who was in a state of joy. He was genuinely happy for Abuna, and he was rejoicing with him. He was rejoicing for his friend who no longer needed to, uh, to, uh, to struggle. He was rejoicing with heaven because they have another saint, and he's like, like this friend was like, you know, uh, he was on point. The fourth, rejoicing, but his heart revealed depression and darkness. Because he saw Abuna as a competitor and a position that he was envious that God had grace on. That one's kind of like surprising because, you know, rejoicing, but deep inside, there was envy there. Deep inside, there was envy. The fact that he, he competed with Abuna to see who was, you know, who was doing better. And there was no love in that. There was no love in that at all. And the fifth one was a bland spirit. The bland spirit was indifferent about whatever was happening. Whatever was going on around him, he really, whatever, right? Because he was so concerned with his own responsibilities, his own self, his own ambition, that whatever happened to those around him didn't really, really matter, right? And that's concerning too. So I will tell you, when I looked at those five friends, I said, okay, well, which one would I be? Right? And if we were honest with each other, we all probably have a little bit but we know where we should be. We should be friend number three, right? With pure rejoicing, pure joy, happy for his friend, and happy for heaven for having another saint. Um, now, this is a part of the story where it, it kind of, it gets you, right? Because before crossing over, Abuna Butros sees devils. So now they're in like this vast area, and he sees this group of devils, and they're staring at him. And he said they're hideous. And they're headed by a mighty devil 
whose heart was pierced by an, angel, uh, an arrow, and his beard had been like kind of like partially like plucked out. And it says that these devils were like anxious and uneasy, and they were just awaiting the moment of crossing over and its outcome. Right? And, um, like they were there waiting for him to oh, see yeah. where he's going. Oh, yeah. Like this is, this is going to be like decision time, right? Because you had all of the devils on one side. On the other side, there was a group of like illuminated angels. And, um, and he said, the angels, though, they did not speak except through praise and hymns, mm-hmm. right? And the first thing I thought about was only speaking like no idle words, right? Like no idle words, only if they were communicating praises and hymns. And he said, the group of the angels outnumbered the group of the devils, and they were closer to Abuna, and they were showing him signs of assurance, being calm, you know, and they were not worried. And the devils were whispering to one another and they were pointing at a woman's robe, yeah. right? And he says, and you see that these, the devils that were carrying many traps and like ways to stumble people. And he said, the crazy thing is, is that when I looked at these devils, their faces looked familiar, right? Like some were even old friends along the way. And he was able to even link them to the, to the sins that they like fell into together, right? Like sins of pride, lying, theft, sexual morality, gossiping. And he says, I recognized most of the devils, right? Like they were very familiar to me. So really quick, think about that. Like there's been devils that have been assigned to different areas of our life. And their whole purpose is to get you to fall into specific sins. You know, that floors me, right? Because the thing is, is like, we're still going through that. Like, he might be experiencing this in the afterlife, but we're still going through this. That we have devils that are victorious over us and setting snares for us and catching us and stumbling us, right? And then he said that he looked at his robe and he saw that the stains on his robe had the image of these devils on them. So he would look at the, the image of pride, uh, the devil of pride, and he would look at the garment and he'd be like, oh, that stain is pride. That stain is gossip, and he's like linking them. Um, <clears throat> and when he, when he took notice of that, it says Abuna was like, he was filled with fear, you know, and he drew closer to the head of the angels, and he asked them about these devils, and he was like, hey, what's going on here, right? And the, and the head angel told them, all of these devils have been, bo- have been following you since birth. Since birth, they've been like setting traps for you and trying to get you to like fall into it. And he says, as a matter of fact, do you see the arrow that's pierced? Like the, the head devil, it says that he had an arrow that pierced his skull and that plucked out beard. He says, that arrow that pierced his skull, that, is, that occurred at your baptism as a blow, right? And when you... When you um, renounced Satan three times, that's when he started plucking out his beard. Right? He's like, they've been with you since then, trying to, to ensnare you. So then Abuna asks the guardian angel, he says, how about the devils that I don't recognize? Like, what about them? And the angel told him, he said, those are the ones whose voices you didn't listen to. Those are the ones that you shut, that you shut out. And that's why you don't recognize them. Or maybe you did fall into one of these sins from one of these other angels, I mean, one of these other devils, these temptations, but your repentance was so pure that it was removed from your garment completely. It was erased from his memory, from the garment, and by the grace of God. So he looked again to the angels, and he looked at them to gather peace from them, and he recognized them the same way that he would see all of these devils and their, and their traits, right, and the things that they were stumbling them into is the same way that he looked at the angels and he recognized some of the angels as well because these angels were carrying virtues with them. He recognized them in love, meekness, simplicity, peace, humility. And he said oh, with these angels, in one hand, they carried a bouquet of good deeds and virtues. In the other hand, um, uh, he realized that they were the same things that the Holy Spirit had been enticing to, to do all along. So the same way you have the devils with their sin and their traps and this and that. You look at the angels, they got the bouquet, virtues, good deeds, linked right up to the Holy Spirit. 
And he said that I remember when these things were spoken to me and when he was trying to entice me to do good things, right? And then the other hand, a sharp, uh, sharp sword. Now, sharp sword in the body of, body of armor, what does that represent? Truth. And the thing is, is that that sword, the part of the body of armor, has authority to destroy the armies of the devil. So you had the good, the good deeds and you had the sword. That's how the angels were helping, right? So just imagine the sitting at hand now, right? So you had the devils on one side, you had the angels on the other side, you've got a Buna who's in the middle who's terrified. Um, and he says, while all of this is happening in this great vast area, then to the east the door opens, leading to a new area. It says, it was bright and I couldn't see it um, I couldn't see what was on the other side, right? But all I could tell it was bright, and I longed for it. Like, I, every ounce in me wanted to go there. And then on the other side, of, to the west, another door opened. And that door opened, and it seemed as if it was, bottom, it was a bottomless pit. And it inflicted terror into his heart. Terror into his heart. And he said, like, every ounce in me, I was longing to go towards the east, but... Two angels appeared in soldiers' attire and it stopped him and it said, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And they reminded him that he had a debt which had not yet been paid. And he said, and when he ran into that opposition at the same time, right, the evil group of demons had the right to take him. And that he felt a very, very strong force that was pulling him to the west Right? And it was led by his garment, the stained and the hold garment. And it said at that point, Abuna was screaming in panic and asked his guardian, uh, guardian angel for help. And the guardian angel looked at him and it just explained to him, he said, the stains on your robe are naturally attracted to the bottomless pit. And there is no way to erase them since the time of repentance has already passed. So at this point, you can imagine Abuna, right? you know, he's being pulled towards the bottom of this pit. He's scared. He sees, like, everything in the way that it's going down, right? And it's not looking good for him by any means. And then he said he's going towards the bottom of the bottomless pit, and at the last moment, Abuna yells, where is Christ of my salvation? Right? And at this point, he says that the repentance that I felt inside my heart, you know, I had been so sorry for everything I had done. I, I regretted staining my robe, uh, you know, I regretted the mess, everything that I had ever done, there was nothing that could ever justify it, and I had so much remorse that all I can do was yell, for where is the Christ? Where is my Savior? Right? But there was no one there to help him. He called for the angels, but no one even dared to come rescue him. You know, the devils had victory written all over their face, right? And he was weeping and wailing. And it says, right before he fell into the bottomless pit, there appeared a great light. And it was radiant, it was dazzling, and a person in a flame of fire, so glorious and beautiful in appearance, too wonderful to even describe. He says that I could not even express the immensity of his loveliness when he was looking at him. He says that this man was surrounded by a myriad of angels and saints, and he said the second I knew him, I knew exactly who he was. You know, and I fell before him, and I... I, I looked at him and I requested for help without even uttering a single word. I knew him. I knew his love. I knew everything about him. And he said it was crazy because I found that, he said that I found that I resembled him and I bore his features and I was in his image in every way except the robe. Except the robe. You know, he's, and at that moment, I saw the most beautiful human being I've ever seen. And it was the one who had never left me for a single moment. At that point, he realized that since the very beginning, Christ had always been by his side. And as soon as he extended his hand, wrapping it around me, I saw in his palm the, the, the remnant of a deep wound. And his wound was still bleeding. And a drop, a single drop from the wound Yes, a drop of the divine blood, just a single drop, was enough to erase all the filth of my sin. And it cleaned the entire robe. And at that moment, 
the pit stopped pulling me. And a scream resound, and the, and the devils fell down into the bottomless pit from a single drop. And here's a crazy thing that he, he brought up. So do you guys remember earlier, he said that when he was departing, there was another soul that was departing as well. He, comp he called it his companion. He said, at this time, he looked at his companion who was still drifting into the debt, and he screamed, this is Christ. This is the Savior. You know, this is Jesus. But his, compa his companion did not understand what he meant. And the crazy part is, is when Abuna was referring to his companion, he said, he had a robe and I had a robe. But his robe was cleaner than my robe. That is how he saw it when they were both departing. And now he's, he's here. He's looking at his companion. He's saying, this is a Christ. This is a salvation. This is, this is what you need. Right? And he says that his companion was not able to recognize the source of salvation, nor did he believe in him, even though his robe was cleaner than mine. Because the time had passed for him to know. And his voice resonated into the plunge of the bottomless pit. Wrap your mind around that thought real quick. Right? And I know a lot of the times we feel that we need to live perfect lives. And we need and we should strive for that, every single one of us. But I'm going to tell you that a single drop of God's blood was enough to wipe away everything. And the, his companion in death, even though his robe was cleaner, without Christ, he was never going to be able to make it in. So although we should strive out of love for the love of God compels us to do everything that we should do. It's the love of God that just compels us. We cannot not respond to that. But don't ever think that you're going to get in there without God's blood. Christ's blood is the only way. A single drop is all that's needed. So he watched his companion plunge into the bottom of this pit. And then he looked at his robe and it might have been clean. But he was still ashamed. It was not appropriate to be wearing in the presence of God. And it's crazy because he says, I felt this way, but I couldn't utter it. But Christ knew exactly what I was thinking in a loving manner, and he quickly clothed him with a bright new white robe. And he says he put on this robe, and in this robe, there were threads that were shining. They were illuminating. And this is a beautiful picture of what Christ means when he gives us his righteousness, when he gives us his holiness. It is actually him who gives us what belongs to him so it can go on to us. And then, and then Abuna says, and then the door to the east opened. And he heard the sound of hymns, of victory, of salvation, the praise of angels, the voices of the saints, the smell of the aroma of the pure prayers. And he, and he wanted to write about it, but he said like the, English, like the humanly language could not even express the things that I saw. And then he looked to the side of Christ and he saw the stab wound. And he says that when he looked at it, a new, a new life rushed through him and it changed all of his senses. He instantly learned the mystery behind those and why the threads shined. Because the shiny threads in his new garment were directly related to his good works. And he was surrounded by a crowd of saints. And right away, it was like he knew every single one of them and they all had one form and they all had one likeness. And each wore a bright robe but the intensity of the glow varied from one to another. And at the right hand, there was a beautiful, gentle woman, and her robe was exceedingly bright. Her robe was brighter than all of the other humans. Her robe was even brighter than the angels. She clothed all of those who have not, um, she clothed all of those who asked who are not yet done with their struggle. St. Mary, so that's our intercessor, who's still praying for those who are still struggling. He says, and then I saw a group who were distinguished by shining crowns. Can anyone guess what the shining crowns were? The martyrs. He says, I recognize St. George, I recognize St. Dimiana, and many of the saints that we know through the story, but there was also many that we have never heard their story. And they had a beautiful aroma of the blood that was shed in the name of Christ, which allowed them to attain the crown of martyrdom. There were other groups. There were groups called the Loving Group. And each was holding a harp, and they, pra they praised continuously. And this group was known for their love towards God 
and the amount of praise that they poured out. There was another group that had illuminated different body parts, abdomens for their asceticism, heads because they had no place to, race, uh, to rest their head, legs for those who were wounded, uh, I'm sorry, legs for those who wandered into the uh, hermits in the desert and in the wilderness. They had those who were rewarded for their torture and who refused to accept release. They all had different body parts illuminated if they had the parts that were cut off or tortured. One of the angels came to him and he said, I, I need to bring you to your place. And he took him to the very, very, very back row. And he put him in the back row because his row was the least illuminated. And he says, and I'll be honest with you, it didn't bother me one bit. It didn't bother. He's like, he said, my cup was full. And I was so full of peace and joy. And that he was so happy to be even considered worthy to be there at all. But then something happened. He realized that his time was not done struggling. For he was still in the body and his time had not come. And he woke up. And from that moment on, he was filled with the yearning for heaven. And it was filling him like a flame. And he was filled with hope and he was determined to start washing his robe in the blood of the Lamb. He was determined to offer a sincere repentance so when that day does come to him, his robe is going to look very, very different for the day that when he met, you know, when he met Christ. So my question is, can we be filled with the same desire? If we know that's what every single one of us is heading towards, if we know that this whole life means absolutely nothing until we get to that day and how that day goes, because that's where we're going to spend eternity. I hope that we are filled with this desire. And then shortly after he wrote this letter, shortly after, I don't know exactly how long after, because I haven't finished the book, but um, shortly after he, he wrote that letter, he departed. So when I read this, it was very motivating for me, right, to think about these things, because the reality of it is, this stuff is all real. We might not like to think about it, we might not like to pursue it because there's other things that we like to give our time to. There's other things that it's easier for us to pursue. There's more pleasure to it. There's more glory to it. There's more power to it. But I hope that in the coming weeks going through this book, this will teach us more about what heaven is like and will put the desire inside of us to prepare ourselves for it. And be God ever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, because these are little glimpses into heaven that you give us. Just an opportunity to know, Lord, that this is not all for nothing, but to encourage us, Lord, because eternity is going to be amazing. So, Lord, don't let us get caught up in, in this hundred years we spend in this tent, Lord. And even though we think that it's going to be really nice to fill our cell with a bunch of stuff, in the reality of it, none of it's going to matter. When that knock on the door happens, Lord, we're not going to want to take anything with us. But then the real test comes, Lord. How much do we really love you? How much do we really pursue you? How much do we really offer to you? How much do we really turn away from sin? How much do we really live in the good works that you've laid out for us? For, Lord, that's the stuff that's going to have eternal glory and eternal value, Lord. So, Lord, I ask that you, just, uh, that you be with this group right here, Lord, this church. Lord, I thank you for the anniversary of this church and, and the fact that your hand has been you know, just over this church since day one. And I ask that you continue to do great things. I ask that you bless our priests, Lord, that you give them the wisdom to shepherd our flock, Lord. I ask that you allow us to be good sheep to them, Lord, that we will listen, that we will take correction, Lord, that we will follow, Lord. But Lord, most importantly, I ask that you give us eyes for you, the true shepherd that we will follow you and desire you in everything that we do, Lord, and that you will take the throne of our life, Lord, and that we stop worshiping other things. For one day, Lord, we will all stand in that vast area and we will be accountable to the decisions that we made. And I ask that they be decisions that are pleasing to you. I ask in the sessions of the Holy Virgin Mother, Thay Togo St. Mary, all your saints and my tears. Here's we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is we use our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation but to listen to the evil of the Christ Jesus our Lord Father the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Lord and ever Amen